episode here. So we're, we're rolling now. Usually I start the episode out with uh, just a little bit of background on who you are. Tell, tell my listeners uh, a little bit about Anthony, your origin story, uh, where you come from and why the hell you're doing SaaS sales. Yeah. Thanks for having me, man. So sure. um, yeah, great, great to be here. Um, I am originally from New Jersey, went to school in Arizona, which I know you're a Phoenix guy. I went to the U of A. Um, so oh, I'm very man. familiar with the area. Yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And so I, I got my, I guess, start in sales like most kind of accidentally, you know, I went to school for uh, finance and real estate and I was going to do commercial real estate back in New York. And then um, having been in a fraternity, I, I had this, uh, this guy reach out to me with this uh, opportunity to join this like hot fintech company in San Francisco. And at the time it was 2015 and, you know, fintech was like the buzz. Um, and so I, I took a chance and went there and uh, what I soon realized that it wasn't really fintech; it was more like working with mortgage brokers and yeah. making a ton of cold calls and sure. things like that. But really, from a from a young age, um, I'd never been really book smart. Not because like I wasn't smart, but I never like it was never my thing. I never mm -hmm. really applied myself. Um, and so my my dad always said, you know, you'd be great in sales. He's a former VP of sales now runs his own company and. Um, while I was never really book smart, I had that street smart and I like to call it like the figure it out factor. So right. I took that, I took that approach to the, the mortgage industry, spent three years there, built some really thick skin, some sales acumen, some human interaction acumen, um, yeah, sure. was making tons of calls, sending a bunch of emails. That company didn't end up being the right fit for me long-term. So after year three, it's about yeah. 24, 25 uh, moved to a company called demand base where I started as an SDR, um, and really worked my way up, got promoted in nine months, became an AE, spent three years there, hit president's club, did well, went over to outreach, uh, .io, And now I'm over at lattice as an enterprise seller. So, um, I'm now 29. So just in five years, I've made it from coming out of a non- a traditional SaaS background to starting as an SDR to now being an enterprise seller. So hopefully so, that gives some good context yeah, about me. No, no, that's fantastic. And now, now I have a bunch of questions because, and, and some context is, you know, most of my listeners uh, out there are, you know, either pretty early in their SaaS journey, their, their SaaS career journey, or uh, a good percentage of my listeners are folks that aren't in the industry right now, and they may be in something like mortgage lending or healthcare, you know, durable medical sales or something like that. Uh, or maybe they're not even doing sales altogether. They're, you know, a, a nurse or an elementary school teacher or something along those lines. So what I, what I really think would be valuable for my listeners, because I'm seeing here, you went from the, the lending industry and then suddenly ended up at a company like demand base, which is a really well-known SaaS company spent, you know, several years there. Uh, and from your, your numbers, it sounds like you were pretty successful there. How did you break into to tech from, you know, the lending world? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I think living in San Francisco at the time, SAS was blowing up in 2018. And I knew that I wanted something more. I had a lot of friends in SAS, if you will. And I knew that it would provide me with an opportunity to really challenge myself, start from the ground up um, and, and, and move up the ranks that way. I think mm -hmm. oftentimes, um, you know, we think that we have to be uh, super successful in SaaS in order to move to a different SaaS company or folks think that we need to have a ton of experience in order to break in. And the reality is, is that's not really true. And so- right. The way that I the way that I really thought about breaking in was okay. What type of company do I want to want to work at? Is it one of those big like Salesforce, LinkedIn, huge companies that are very well established and it's kind of like plug and play where the playbook's already built out. You just kind of kind of go in, or do I want to work for more of a scrappy startup, Series A, Series B, where there's maybe right. not not as much of a playbook and I have to you know, get myself ingrained there and probably a bigger learning curve, or mm -hmm. do I want to be somewhere in the middle? And yeah. so I decided to land somewhere in the middle where there was good product mar market fit. I knew some people that worked at the company. Um, 
I was, I was passionate about the problems it was solving. Um, and I knew that I could work my way up, you know? And so I think having a end goal when you sure. break into SAS is really important. So I wanted to be an account executive, right? Like right. most people want to be like account executives <laughs> when you break yeah. into SAS. So yeah. I wanted to go somewhere that I was able to break in and, and move up uh, pretty quick. And I think taking what I learned from the mortgage industry, those intangibles, I call them like the unteachables, the figure it out factor mm -hmm. helped me so much uh, as an SDR. And I think a lot of people that aren't in SAS have those intangibles and they oftentimes perform better than people with experience that don't have those intangibles. So um, right. for anyone out there listening, I encourage you to take your strengths and apply that to break it into SaaS because you don't need the experience um, to succeed. All the awesome. Time. No, that's, that's huge. And, and so did you, I think you mentioned someone, you knew someone at demand base or you knew someone in SaaS who, who sort of helped you get into the industry or, you know, how, how did you get that app at, I guess, at, at demand base specifically? Uh, how did that door open? Because again, that's that's probably one of the biggest questions I get from listeners is, you know, how do I make the, the jump from, you know, again, healthcare, lending, uh, whatever, into yeah. the, the tech world, especially because I don't have any experience yet. And I have the drive, I'm willing to go do the work, but uh, I don't have anyone who's willing to take a, a chance on me just yet. So walk us through. And again, you, you did also mention and I, I'm a big believer of this too, that location is key. And I, right before we got on air, I was telling you how I started my tech career in Austin. Uh, and I even left my hometown to get to Austin so that I could do that. And I think, you know, you mentioned that being in, in the San Francisco Bay area at the time you were there was an incredibly valuable thing uh, in, in, in sort of jump starting that part of your career, but anything else that you did to kind of network your way into, into tech? Yeah. So I, you know, luckily did know some people uh, at demand base, but that wasn't like the one company that I wanted to go after. And there was a lot of companies I wanted to work for, but I didn't know anyone at. So uh, what right. I did and what I would recommend those do is there's tools out there that are free that allow you to search the leaders of those teams. So if you want to be an SDR and you figure out a company that you really want to work at, identify mm -hmm. who that person is, find their email, find their phone. And what are you going to be doing as an SDR? You're going to be prospecting every day. What better right. way to show that you're the right candidate than to prospect the hiring manager? So what you yeah. can do for anyone listening is understand who the hiring managers are and show off your skills and share why you think you would be a good fit. You know, hey, I saw you were hiring. Um, here's why I think I would be a good fit based on my experience. Like worth giving me giving me a look, something like that. Yeah. And more, more times than not, SDR leaders who are leading those teams, AE leaders who are leading those teams, they love that. They love that yeah. shit. Like they do yeah. 100% I, because yeah. Yeah. That, that shows how you, that shows what type of uh, uh, team player you're going to be. It shows what, what type of employee you're going to be. Um, and oftentimes people that are transitioning from other SaaS companies they're just like going through a recruiter or they're uploading their, their resume. Mm -hmm. There's thousands of people at times applying for these jobs. You got to find a way to stand out. And I think that's definitely one of them. If you're coming from a non-traditional background. No, that's awesome. And, and I'm a big believer in start doing the job. And that applies to people who are in the field already, who, you know, if you're an SDR, start doing the AE job as best as you can. Don't, don't piss anybody off or don't overstep, but there are things you can be doing in every role uh, to prepare you for the next one. And even if you're, you know, a strategic AE, you can be thinking about what your next move is, uh, and, and some of the skill sets you need to build to, to get to the next level. Right. So I think the same applies for any candidate. You're exactly, I think, dead on with the advice for candidates is go start doing the job. And in, in your example, doing the job is start reaching out to the hiring managers or the executives or the founders or whoever, whoever makes those decisions and start, you know, personally introducing yourself and, and doing, you know, essentially the job of an SDR, which is, reaching out and building rapport with executives, leaders, uh, decision makers. And I think you're going to showcase, uh, you know, you'll be able to showcase that skill set that will then put you in a good position, set you apart from other candidates who, to your point, are just filling out an application and then sitting back and waiting for a phone call that's never going to happen. Uh, I think that's, that's really, really great advice. Um, awesome. So, so demand base, you went to outreach, which is a, you know, incredibly well-known company, uh, in the SaaS industry. And now you're at Lattice. I've heard of Lattice as well. Uh, one of the, the sort of follow-up questions I had too to your, your story is, 
you know, you're 29 years old, you've accelerated pretty quickly through the, you know, the, the kind of standard career path in, in SaaS, which is you start in the SDR role where you're focused on demand gen and lead gen, setting lots of appointments, making phone calls, those kind of things. And now you're in a strategic role. What do you think you did uh, to sort of bypass, you know, maybe the years, a lot of times that, you know, that, that journey can take someone over a decade to get to a strategic selling role, uh, maybe even more sometimes. Uh, what do you think you did to kind of shortcut the process or, or, you know, bypass some of the just, you know, years of paying dues? Yeah, really good question. Two things immediately come to mind. Number one is building your internal brand at the companies. Mm -hmm. I got promoted from SDR to AE in nine months. There are people that have been in the SDR role for two years that didn't get promoted before me. The only way that I was able to do that was building my internal brand, doing the things that others weren't willing to do, like speaking up at our SKO. I would volunteer to help our VP. I would share uh, advice and insights in our Slack channel. And I would send uh, examples of email templates that were working, right? Doing yeah. all the intangible things that others weren't willing to do to put myself in that position when the, when the promotion was available, I was a no-brainer. I would build a relationship right. with the, the VP of mid-market sales at Demandbase. I would become really close with my AE that I worked with. And, and he and she would give feedback to the hiring manager like, okay, this guy, I don't know what's, what it is about him, but he's got it, right? Yeah. And more times than not, even though you may not have as much ex experience, hiring managers, whether it's moving up in the organization or moving to a different company, they want those type of people because you can learn all the other stuff. You can't teach someone to have the intangibles, those unteachables, the ability to do the things that others won't do. So that's the first thing um, that I really think helped excel, uh, accelerate my career. The second yeah. thing is owning your own personal development, not sure. relying on just your manager or sales enablement to give you the coaching. I went out, I read the books but I took action on the books. I applied mm -hmm. myself. You know, I watched all the YouTube videos on cold calling and I would re read all of, like the HubSpot articles. And oh, uh, those about, are good. Yeah. yeah like I, yeah. I was obsessed with getting better. I was mm -hmm. obsessed with making progress. I wanted to improve and approve to myself that I could do this. And now, you know, as an AE, I still own my own personal development. Like I'm always trying to get better. I think that's mm -hmm. the key, right? It's the people yeah. that really want it for themselves and want to get better and owning that personal development. It accelerates your career, like getting a coach, getting a mentor, um, yeah. reaching out to the best people in your role or the role that you want to be in and asking them for help, right? That's right. one of the first things I did at yeah. outreach. I found the best rep on the enterprise team. I found the best rep on the uh, commercial team that I was on, which was mid-market. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Hey, is it cool if we meet like bi-weekly? And they're yeah. like, sure. And that's the yeah. best way to accelerate your, your, your growth is own that personal development. I'm glad you brought this up. This is actually, a, I've been meaning to make a whole podcast on this topic uh, because I think people sleep on this a little bit. And a lot of times, you know, folks ask me like, so, so how, you know, how did you get your job that you have today? You know, enterprise account executive, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, or how did you navigate this and that? And, you know, what about the times when you wanted to give up and you hit like a, a wall in your career when you're like, wait, where, where the hell am I going? Uh, my answer is usually, well, exactly what yours is, which is I invested a lot in myself. I've spent, you know, thousands of dollars of my own money. I didn't wait around for my employer to, you know, fund some big expensive sales coach to come in. I've been fortunate that I have, you know, in recent years, uh, had a couple of sessions with some expensive sales coaches that were company funded, but early on in my career, it was, it was buying, you know, you start with books, right? You go to Amazon and buy, uh, a handful of sales books. I've done, you know, a whole podcast episode on the books that that really influenced my career. Uh, there's tons of lists out there where you can go find kind of the top, you know, books on sales, marketing, business. So I think that's a really cheap way to invest in yourself is go to Amazon or get an Audible account and and start, you know, listening and reading books. But then, you know, I started taking courses and paying for coaching and things like that as well. And you know, it's funny at the time it felt really risky because you're spending hundreds or thousands of dollars on, on mentoring or coaching or uh, a course or something along those lines. 
But I look back and I'm, I'm really glad I did that because it, it gave me a lot of skin. It put, put a lot of skin in the game for me. And yeah. I learned some things that my peers weren't going to learn uh, because I was paying for the knowledge, right? I was, I had a, you know, extra lever that I could pull and other networks. Most, most of the time, if you do coaching or, or a course or something like that, you're also put into like this community of other people that are doing it. And it builds your network in ways that, you know, I think early on, I couldn't really anticipate how they'd benefit me. Uh, but they've, they've turned out, you know, over the years to be pretty valuable. So I'm glad you brought that up because I've never had a chance to really talk about that. But one-on-one, -on -one, I've told a lot of people, if you want to be an insanely great in, in SaaS sales, uh, it does start with, you know, reading, uh, you know, getting your Amazon list. I actually have an Amazon list that I'll share of like my top sales and business books, but then, you know, hiring, coaching, mentoring courses. And then your last point, which was, when you go into a new company, uh, find out who the top performer is as quickly as you can and start to create sort of a, uh, like a mind share, a, a tr you know, brain trust, whatever the cliche, uh, you know, jargon is for, for the, you know, for the group, but basically you're, you're putting time on someone's calendar every other week or every month or every quarter to have them sort of download their, their knowledge, their tribal knowledge into, into you. So you can start going out and, and delivering. And then, you know, if, if you're me, you go start a whole podcast where you bring on some of the industry's best sellers and you pick their brains on what they're doing and start to get the, you know, the, the, the inside look at how people are successful, but I'm glad you brought that up. I think that's a super, super interesting key. And that definitely explains why, you were able to fast track your, your results and career progression, you know, in compare, in comparison to others who might take 10, 15 years to, to take the same journey you did. Yeah. And can I share one more thing on that? Yeah, please. Right. I think people will listen to this, some of them, and they'll say, well, I don't have the money to do that. Or I don't, I don't think I can. And it can seem scary, which I totally get, but realistically, most of us are spending money on dumb shit that mm -hmm. we don't need. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I used to, uh, this is a conversation for a, a, a whole podcast, but I used to gamble my ass off three years ago. I have gambling addiction and right. I wasted, I wasted thousands and thousands of dollars where that money could have went to self-development, not saying everyone has gambling addiction, but you know, I would spend money on clothes and Starbucks and coffee that, that money adds up over time. And so if it you really can does. save a little, save a little bit every day, the end of the month, you may have 200 bucks left over that you can invest in some books or uh, whatever it is. So I think, you know, we all, we all want to invest in ourselves, but then say we can't do it, but then we'll go out and buy alcohol or Uber Eats right. or <laughs> yeah. whatever. So it's like, have that honest conversation with yourself and figure out where you can find some extra, some extra money by just you don't need to be making more money to, to do it, but mm -hmm. just subtract the bad habits that are maybe like taking money away from you. That's that a you great point. Investing. Yeah. I have, I have a line item in my annual budget that I do just personal budgeting, uh, that, that basically says, you know, investment in career development, you know, business knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. And, and it's changed over the years. It's gotten, fortunately, uh, you know, I've been able to spend more on personal development, then in the past, again, for me, it, it probably started as buying like a $30 book. And then, you know, that advances into maybe like a couple hundred dollar course and then a thousand dollar course or mastermind or whatever. And, uh, you know, it, it's a progression, but I would recommend anyone listening, uh, it's great advice from Anthony here is, is, you know, set aside some money, uh, that you would normally spend on something that is, you know, not benefiting you personally, whether that's fast food or gambling or alcohol or whatever, uh, and put that towards, you know, your personal development and you're going to see major, major results. So that's awesome, man. Yeah. hundred percent. So on the, on the topic of coaching, I know you have, you do coaching. Tell us a little bit about the work you do on, on that front. You know, in addition to, I, I know you're, you're a seller and that's, that's who we talk to mostly on the show is, is frontline sellers who are carrying a quota, selling to, you know, either the commercial or, or enterprise or strategic level accounts. Um, but kind of talk to us about what you're working on now and, and what your emphasis is in, in your coaching side of the world. Yeah. Yeah. Appreciate the question. Um, so as I mentioned, I was an SDR and yeah. I fell in love with this idea of prospecting, right? Top of funnel pipeline gen, because I saw the impact that it had from a very uh, early stage my, both my AEs went to president's club because of the pipeline I was able to generate them. Did and you get to go with them? 
<laughs> Did you get to uh, go with him? Or <laughs> I, I won rookie of the year, but rookie of the years didn't go to get to go to Cabo. <laughs> right. That's, that's the unfortunate injustice of the SDR role is that you, you might contribute, you, you, you contribute in a like very material way to the success of someone who then gets to go and spend yep. a week in Cabo. Yep. Yeah. But, but so I took that mindset and I said, wow, like if, if I was setting them the meetings that it took to get them to president's club, then when I get promoted to AE, I could probably do the same thing just, but for me. Right. And so that muscle never went away from the time I got promoted to this very day. I'm not perfect, but I try to find the time to prospect every single day. And that muscle has changed the way that um, I'm able to show up as a sales professional, right? Like pipeline solves a lot of, a lot of your problems. Mm -hmm. So with that, started building my brand on LinkedIn um, around prospecting and tips, tips from the trenches, if you will, around like what's really working from a, a practitioner that's doing this every single day. And I started getting feedback from people of like, Hey, can I get some time on your calendar to go through this? And people yeah. sending like email examples. Hey, can you do a little email tear down? Or what do you think of my call script? And it got to a point where, um, my time, uh, was, getting, I guess, taken up from a lot of these free sessions. And so I started charging a little bit and yeah. I was doing it. I was doing it only via inbound requests because mm -hmm. I was getting a lot. And, and you talked about like accountability and skin in the game. And so I wanted yeah. to charge to see who really cared about their personal development and wanted to really improve. So I did that for a while, um, got people some great results uh, and yeah. strictly around prospecting. Cause that's like my, my skill that I think I could really help people with that along with like the mental health and mindset piece. Yeah. And then um, one day my friend said, Hey, you should make a post about it and just share that. Like you've been doing it and you want to open it up a bit. And so I did. And, and now I work with a very select few SDRs and AEs that um, are in B2B SaaS that are looking to um, not go through some like crazy, you know, 12 week course, but really want actionable prospecting tips that they can mm. act on, say and yeah. do the same exact day. So whether that's workshopping together on building out sequences or changing messaging, um, you'd be surprised, man. Like the, the folks that I talk to get very little coaching. The emails right, that I right. see are terrible. And all we need to do is make a couple different mindset shifts about how you think about outbound and prospecting. Mm -hmm. And it makes all the difference in the world. So that's been my focus. And uh, it's it's really fulfilling because you you get these messages from people of like, hey, I just, you know, I was a fitness trainer and now I'm an SDR and you helped me hit my quota in the first month. It's like, yeah, that yeah. that shit is awesome. Um, so again, lots of questions here. This is great. Uh, what, uh, yeah, talk to us a little bit about the mindset because it sounds like a big emphasis that, that you put into it is is mindset. What, what are some learnings that, that you've seen as far as, you know, especially for someone who's coming in new to the industry, new to the role, how can they start to work on their mindset so that they are successful in, you know, an outbounding prospecting type role? Yeah, man. So great question. Again, we're in a performance-based role. Sure. So naturally your self-worth oftentimes can be tied to hitting or missing your quota. And that's a slippery slope to yeah. go down. Yeah. So early in my career, and this stemmed from when I was a very young age, I had issues with my own self-worth as a person. And so I latched on to being in sales because if I did well, man, that makes Anthony really great. But right. there were times when I didn't hit my quota and I felt like shit. Yeah. And yeah. my external world was driving how I showed up internally rather than my core values, my integrity, me feeling good about myself, letting it drive how I show up externally. And so I, I got myself to a point in my career where I was, you know, six figures in debt. I was 60 pounds overweight. I was burnt out as hell, all because my self-worth was tied to these external things, one of them being right. my quota. Wow. And so I had to go down this path the last three years of, of really shifting how I thought about myself. Um, and so the biggest piece of advice that I have for people trying to break into sales or SaaS or people that are in SaaS and having trouble with this idea is that whether you hit or miss your quota doesn't make you more or less of a person. 
-hmm. your self-worth should not be tied to how you succeed or don't succeed in your role, right? And what that allowed me to do, like detaching from the end result, was yeah. really focus on the controllable daily inputs rather than thinking about my quarterly quota. Like mm -hmm. the quarterly quota, the monthly quota, that's important, but we yeah. can't control that because it hasn't happened yet. So instead, mm -hmm. let's try to focus on the controllable inputs every single day like making the 50 dials in that hour and not ignoring it and not putting it off. Because if you make those 50 dials today and you make them tomorrow and you make them the next day, those yeah. days will add up into weeks, they'll lead up to months. And then all of a sudden you've got yourself the meetings booked because you just focused on the, the controllable inputs. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's the biggest, there's two takeaways from that, that uh, long monologue, if you will, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 Try your best to live a, a fulfilling and abundant life outside of work so that you're filling your cup so that on the days that are shitty, yeah. you're not feeling shitty as a person because your self-worth, again, is so much more than just a number. And then the second thing is have the courage and the awareness to focus on the things you can control. And, and have the courage to let go of the things that you can't, it's scary mm -hmm. to let go yeah. of like the, those things in the future that we can't control yet. But once you do that, it's a little bit liberating because you focus on your energy, the, the, the limited capacity we have on the things we can actually can, can control. Yeah, no, this is great. I love this conversation. Cause I, I had a similar one with Ian Koniak on the show a couple months back. And I know yep. his coaching is really very much focused on addiction recovery, mental health, uh, mindset. And so it's really cool to hear the similarities in, in what you're you know, talking about. And, and, you know, of course, thanks for, for sharing. I know it's really personal to share, you know, self-worth type stuff on, on the air like this and, uh, you know, addictions or anything like that is always, I think the audience, it resonates a lot with the audience, um, because I think it, it is a bigger problem than we've, uh, we've given it, you know, credit for in the past or given it, you know, attention in the past is, is this tying your self-worth up to the results that you deliver. And my question for you is what, you know, when you have someone maybe who maybe comes to you and says, sure, great. I, I mean, I can write down affirmations or I can, you know, do meditation or whatever other, you know, steps you recommend for them, but that doesn't keep my manager off my back. I still have this sales manager that is, you know, cracking the whip over my head and asking me to deliver this week or this month or this quarter. What do you say to someone who's maybe in that situation where, uh, you know, their, their manager or their management, or maybe it's the company culture is, is one where it's hyper competitive and they're finding themselves, you know, falling into bad health, you know, poor health, poor mental health, a bad mindset, and then ultimately, you know, poor results. What's maybe the first step of helping someone dig themselves out of that hole? Yeah, really good question. Again, the biggest thing is when you have a manager breathing down your neck or whatever, um, you got to ask why, right? If you're not hitting your, if you're not hitting your daily controllables, which is like your calls, your emails, you know, that you got to take ownership of that. You got to take, yeah. I love the book by Jocko Willink, extreme, extreme ownership, ownership right? Yeah. Not, not blaming others and, and taking uh, the ownership on, on your end. And if you are focusing on the daily tasks that you need to complete and the results still aren't coming again, take ownership, check your messaging out. Is your messaging yeah. what's going on? How are you running discovery calls? How are you running your demos? Right? Like, and ask for help proactively. Um, and I think if you're doing all those things and you're still not getting the support and you feel like you're in a toxic environment, then yeah. you may need to take a step back and, and, and understand it. Is this the best environment for you to be in? So long as you know, you're doing all the right things, right? right. You got to make sure that you're doing all the right things before you make any assumptions if this is the right fit for you or not. But mm -hmm. if after the quarter you've done what you can in your control and there's still a lot of things outside of your control happening and you've got your manager who's in your one-on-ones only talking about what's important to the business and not important to you as the individual, then yeah. that's that's a bit of a red flag. I think sure. um sure. you know the the relationship with man frontline managers um their job is very hard. 
but their job is also to support you as an individual and understand maybe what's going on. So um, for any managers listening out there, I encourage the, the ones that are prioritizing what's important to the individual continue to do that. But if you're only talking yeah. about daily metrics and numbers, like there's more that goes into that than just, you know, executing on those things. There could be other things going on, but again, I think the takeaway is mm -hmm. make sure that you're focused on the things you can control and, and execute on those things properly. And if you're doing yeah. those things and you're still getting, you know, your manager breathing down your neck, maybe it's time to take a step back and reevaluate. Yeah, no, that's great. Great advice and advice. I wish I would have had earlier on in my career. Cause I spent way Me too, too many years, way too many years in a bad situation, a bad environment where, you know, again, fortunately I was investing in myself back to that topic. Uh, and I was still very passionate about being successful in the industry. And I knew eventually it would, I would get myself into a position where, you know, I wasn't a good culture. I was, uh, you know, able to be successful and didn't have, you know, people breathing down my neck. And I, I was also able at, to your point earlier to detach my self-worth from my performance in this business. But I, I love that we're talking about this. I really think this is such a huge iceberg of a topic where we're only seeing it, you know, only very few people yourself being included in that are, are actually talking about this publicly. And it is a massive problem in the industry. And I've always said on the show too, that I don't want to be guilty of always painting this picture of like, you know, perfect, awesome SaaS sales career where everything always works out and you come in and you start making multiple six figures and it's a, it's a cakewalk to riches and, and success because you know what you're sharing is it's it's really not you have to do a lot of work on yourself uh you've got to invest a lot in yourself you have to get pretty scrappy you have to be willing to be rejected a lot you have to be willing to put yourself in some really like high pressure environments in order to sort of rise above that and kind of be you know if, like shaped into the person the professional that you know that's going to be successful so I, I think it's really awesome that that you're coming in and sharing that and that, that that's the the focus of the work you're doing with clients you know in addition to the tactics and the the very uh you know actionable business stuff or the 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 specific uh yeah tactics if you will you're also talking about shaping the mindset and you know altering the industry in that way i think that's really cool yeah the uh my mantra is that you can feel fulfilled in life and in your work. They shouldn't be separate. Like you, you can, you can feel fulfilled in both, but it starts with prioritizing yourself first. And that directly affects how you show up every day at work. If yeah. you're showing up and you're feeling good about yourself, that energy is going to feed to other people. They're going to feel that, you know, people, yeah. people want to work with people that have their best interest in mind, but when you're showing up and you're feeling insecure or your, your self-worth is solely predicated on you hitting your number, you're going to naturally have needy, insecure energy. And people don't like to work with people like that. So it's so important, um, not only for that reason, but for when you shut your laptop every day, mm -hmm. like so many people are feeling shitty and that sucks, Yeah, you know? and it's not talked about enough and it should yeah. be. So we talked about this before we came on the air. Uh, we were a little bit cut short today because of a hard stop that I've got coming up here. Uh, so we may have to do a part two because uh, I'm enjoying I'm this down. conversation. I think we have a lot more to talk about. So, so maybe we do a part two here next week. Uh, so just in, in closing for this session, session one with Anthony, uh, I wanted to ask one kind of big question. And then I want to also end with you know where where my listeners can reach out and, and get connected with you. But the, the big question is because your, you know, your emphasis is on prospecting, outreach, outbounding, what are three actions that someone can take today that are going to improve their prospecting capabilities, improve their results right out of the gate? Just three things that come to mind and they don't have to be earth shattering, but I'm just curious, you know, what three pieces of advice you'd give someone who maybe feels like they're hitting a wall with their outbounding. And that person might be me, by the way, who's asking the question, because I, I do kind of feel like that. Go ahead. I love it. Number one yeah. would be uh, niche, niche down your time blocking. A lot of people preach time blocking, but niche it down. So instead of putting a, a two hour block on your calendar to mm -hmm. prospect, chop it up into 30 or an hour blocks of specific tasks. So you know, from nine to nine 30, I'm going to sequence five, 15 new people from nine 30 to 10 30. I'm making 50 dials from 10 yeah. 30 to 10 40. I'm taking a break. And I promise if you just focus on those time blocks and 
have the discipline to execute, you're going to feel much better at the end of the day because you're controlling yeah. what you can control. The That's second solid, thing, yeah. solid gold right there. Yep. The second thing is to, when you're prospecting, focus on problems rather than what your product does. So your messaging mm -hmm. should be persona specific around problems that relate to their role that you know your solution is solved for with other customers. Oftentimes we forget the reason people buy is to solve problems. So what better way to get someone on a meeting to talk about those problems? And when you do that, you get them to validate in their own mind, oh yeah, we do have this problem. Or maybe we're right. using a competitor. That increases response rates. And yeah. when we get a response, it may be an objection, but now we can overcome that objection. When someone gets an email or a call, and it's seller centric, all about us, our product, our features, the prospect doesn't have the ability to connect the dots of why what you're saying is relevant. So yeah. talk about relevant persona based problems, and you'll have better conversations and you'll increase response rates. Awesome. The third thing is there is no silver bullet. Yeah, there's no one channel alone that's going to get you to your number. I'm a firm believer that number one, your messaging needs to be right or else mm -hmm. all the tools in the world will not help you because if you're, if you're just pumping out more shitty messaging, then yeah. that just creates a really bad experience for your prospects. So get your messaging right and then use channels in conjunction. I, I like, uh, I call it the Natoli cannoli special, which is, <laughs> which is, yes. which is a combination of touches on the first and the third day. Okay. between email, phone, and LinkedIn. And then you do the same thing on the third day. So you're increasing the volume in a shortened period of time to build the awareness and to point them back to the problem-specific email. Um, and so again, the channels work, but when they're used together. Interesting. Yeah, it's the, it's the uh, one of my managers used to say, calls, emails, text messages, whatever, LinkedIn and mails are part of a complete breakfast. Uh, you gotta yes. be using them all. I always thought that was really funny. So I just gotta, I have to call out the fact that you came up with the, I, we didn't prepare for that. I just threw it, that question. It was, a, you know, again, kind of a hairy question of you pulled three things out just on the fly here. Uh, and all of them were really good. Uh, I, I was writing them down because, you know, again, asking for a friend, uh, it can get overwhelming to, to continue doing outreach, especially, you know, if you're 10 years into your career, uh, it's hard to, to keep up with the trends and prospecting and outreach. And so it's really cool to hear this advice. Actually, I'm, I'm going to start doing the niche blocking right away. Um, awesome, man. So how, how can my listener, we're definitely going to have to do a second session and we'll get that Absolutely. scheduled. Uh, how can my listeners get in touch with you right away? Yeah. Best place to go is my newsletter. So it's my first and last name dot me. So Anthony Natoli dot me. Okay. I, I send out one uh, newsletter a week. It's under four minutes. And what it is, it's one high quality, actionable prospecting tip that you can say, do act on the same day. And that's it. That is awesome. Uh, I love that idea and, you know, keeping it simple, eliminating a lot of the noise and clutter that comes with signing up for a newsletter. It's just the one quick tip. Um, I will post the link in the show notes for the, the, the newsletter and uh, Anthony, man, thank you so much for coming on, sharing some wisdom with us. Uh, super valuable stuff and can't wait for our next conversation. Same man. Thanks for having me on.